السلام عليكم بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Welcome home everybody It's good to see you الحمد لله um, Can you believe that Ramadan is halfway over? Subhanallah That's fast huh? We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us a good second half and that we're able to have a better second half than we did our first half inshallah ya Rab. Um, Inshallah, we're going to continue tonight uh, with our discussion, um, and we're changing a little bit of a topic shift. So for those of you who uh, maybe weren't here in the beginning or if we forgot, the last few uh, series or last few sessions of hard work are all reflecting on one single hadith of the Prophet وسلم, one single narration in which he was riding uh, a animal and behind him was Ibn Abbas, uh, the great companion, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with both Ibn Abbas and his father Abbas. And in that moment, he gave some deep life advice to Ibn Abbas. And so far, we've covered just like three words, which is crazy because that's how deep the words of the Prophet Sallallahu are. The first advice was for Ibn Abbas, he said, Ihfad Allah, to preserve your relationship with Allah. And we talked about what that meant. And now we're wrapping up the second, the reaction to that, where he says, Yahfadka, that Allah will preserve you and protect you. So last week we talked a little bit about how does Allah preserve us? If we take care of our relationship with Allah, how does Allah take care of us? Meaning, when I look around the world around me, how can I understand that Allah is taking care of me? Okay, and the idea, inshallah, is that as you were going through this hadith in this series, that you're able to, so hey, do you mind, Hafizab, do you mind just closing that back door? The, the idea is, that's your iftar being prepared, by the way. So make dua for them. Tell them not to eat any, by the way. It's not maghrib. So the idea is that we're going to be able to just go through life and by the reflections of uh, Ibn Rajab or Ibn Rajab, we're going to be able to now see the effect of Allah protecting us. You know, I don't know if you guys remember, but when Sheikh Omar did his... Uh, Angels in Your Presence series. It was a couple of years ago. And there was a lot of like uh, stories and moments from the hadith in which he talked about when the angels are present in your life. And when you watch those, when you read those narrations, you realize like, man, subhanAllah, maybe that thing that I thought was just like a coincidence or that thing that was just like, oh, I got lucky. It was actually Allah sending this angel to come and divert this calamity from me. Maybe it was like someone almost hit me on the road. It actually happened, subhanAllah, yesterday. Someone almost hit me on the road and then suddenly they swerved like maybe it was an angel that was there present that was influencing that situation to protect me. And maybe it's because I read my du'as before I left the house, right? I, I ever tell you guys a story about one time uh, in the summer. You guys know in the summer? I don't want to bring up the summer right now, but may Allah help us. 115, 110, 60 days in a row. Let's all just book our tickets now somewhere, all right? Let's go somewhere cold. Um, but I remember in the summer, it was, there was a legitimate drought. I don't know if you guys remember. People were like watering their houses. Do you know what I'm talking about? The foundations of your house, you have to water it because the soil gets so dry. Texas is ajib, man. The soil gets so dry that your house can start to shift because the soil and the foundation that it's built within can start to move. So they actually say like every night you have to spray. Everyone looks crazy. You have to spray the base of your house to bring that soil together. So anyways... I remember it was like 60 days or 50 days in a row where there was no rain. It was like over 100 degrees. It was insane. And I remember that we talked to, you know, we were telling my son Musa like, oh, it's a drought. It's a drought. And uh, he said, what should we do? And I said, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu he used to make dua for rain. Salat al istisqat. He used to go out and pray for rain. And this is something like we did it. Valley Ranch did it. Every Muslim community in Texas was like, yeah, Allah, please give us rain because the earth is, it needs it. So then one night, Musa just made dua for rain. The next day, I'm not joking, it was like a torrential downpour. And it rained so hard that what happens? Another thing that Texas is known for, flash floods. So in one side of it, we're like bone dry. The next side of it, they're like, people are like kayaking down 121 or George Bush. It's so wet. It's so much water. And I remember driving with him and he goes, <laughs> you know, I didn't put the two and two together. But he goes, Baba, I think I made too much dua for rain because you know he's like i gotta answer it right away and there's a there's a cuteness to it there's like a, a innocence to it but there's also a beauty in that there's a beauty in being able to see the du'as that you made 
come to life. And the, 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 the wonderful thing is your du'as are being answered. We just have to pay better attention because you'll see it. And Allah, you know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will send an answer for a du'a that is so obvious. You can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. Like you got into a certain program or you got a certain job or you did this and the chances were not great. Maybe it was 50-50. Maybe it wasn't in your favor. And all of a sudden, some doors opened. You met somebody who knew somebody. They got you an interview. And then six months later, you're sitting at that desk and you're like, but you know the human being, subhanAllah, Allah Ta'ala, He says that uh, uh, the insan or the luman jahula, like we are an oppressively forgetful people. We're so ignorant sometimes. We're sitting there and we don't remember we made that dua. We don't remember that. I always tell couples on their first anniversary when they're like, you know, celebrating, they're going out to dinner. I always tell them, remember how much dua you made for this moment. Remember, you sat there and begged Allah for somebody and then you met them, your queen or your king, right? And then you made dua for everything to go smoothly and the marriage to happen and for it not to break off because you couldn't, you know, decide Nihari or Briyani or chicken makni and then... And then you made du'a, you got through all of that, you got married, you made du'a, you got everything you wanted, and now you're sitting a year later. The best thing a person can do on the anniversary of any accomplishment is to thank Allah for the answer, the answer of his du'a being accepted. You got a job, you got into a school, you got married, you had kids. Ask Allah on the anniversary of that. If it's your birthday, if it's anything. Oh Allah, please ya Allah. I, you know, thank Allah and oh Allah, please make me not forgetful of that. You bless me with this. Okay. So it's important for us to see Allah working around us. And this is kind of what this part says. And we finished last week with the poet. He said something very beautiful. And he said, oh Allah, when I turn to you, I notice that everything becomes easier. He said the distance between me and my goal, it shortens. Everything becomes easier. He goes, but when I think that I can handle it on my own, then I trip over my own two feet. And then he said, Oh Allah, never let me try to handle anything by myself. Always let me call upon you because you always make the thing that I'm seeking easier for me. Okay? Um, now, one of the ways that Ibn Rajab, he says Allah will protect you. You know, we talked about he'll protect your life. He'll protect your progeny. We talked about kids. He'll protect you in your, in your time and your effort. Another way that Allah will protect you, Yahfadka, if you make hifz of Allah in your life, is that he will protect your religion. He will protect your faith, your deen. And this is something that I think all of us can appreciate, but a lot more now, acutely, because we see the effect of strong faith on the hearts and on the faces and in the, in the actions of the people of Gaza and the people that are being oppressed all over the world. When you see that they are experiencing oppression, but somehow, some way, amongst the rubble of their masjid, they're praying Jum'ah. The masjid is destroyed, the minaret is toppled, the dome is on the side, and you have straight lines, and the khatib is, you know, still giving khutbah. And they're praying Jum'ah prayer. You know, part of that is witnessing what it means for a person's faith to be protected. Subhanallah. That a person's religion is that which is preserved for them. Now, I know that this sounds a little bit meta, but I want us to think about this for a second. Why is it so important that your religion is protected? You tell me. There's a question for the audience. Why is it so critical that Allah protect your religion, your belief, your faith? It's an uncomfortable conversation. What does it mean if you lose, what does it mean if you lose it? What happens if you lose your religion? Everyone's like, I just want samosas right now. This is way too deep for a Monday. No one has excuses. I flew in this morning from Michigan at 5 a.m. I haven't slept. So no one has excuses. I, don't, I have zero empathy for anyone right now in this room. My fast is longer than yours, okay, because I had to fly from East Coast to cent, cent, uh, East Time Time Zone to Central Time Zone. So I'm fasting longer than you. I'm tired. I have two kids. Answer my question. Okay. What happened? There you go. Thank you. Okay, so number one, you lose your religion, there goes your chance at paradise. And that's, I mean, that shakes you as is. That kind of raises, you know, the, 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 the skin on your, on your arms like, oh man, you lose Jannah. All of these descriptions that we read about, 
all of the pleasures and all of the relaxation and all of the joy and the felicity of paradise and being with those who you love and being in the company of those who are, you know, the righteous and the prophets and meeting them and meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine? Who do you want to meet in Jannah? You thinking about talking, sitting with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, asking him, what was it like making hijrah from Mecca to Medina? Talking to Umar, what was it like when you converted on that day? Tell me the story. You know, I only heard it from this really miskeen guy named Abdurrahman at Roots. I want to hear it directly from you. What was it like when you converted? What was it like when you accepted Islam? Talking to Aisha radiallahu anha, the genius, incredible scholarly wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, asking her questions. What must it be like? Asking Salah al-Din, what was it like conquering Palestine and opening it for the Muslims? Asking these people these questions. Being able to sit and enjoy and relax. Allah Ta'ala says in Jannah, there is no drama, there is no backbiting, there is no uh, wasted time. No one feels frustration in paradise. So if you lose your faith in Allah, you've now lost the key that will give you felicity and success in the next life. That's number one. Very good. Very good. But what else? Yeah. Okay. So you don't only lose your next life, which is enough. Like we don't have to go any further. You also, part of the gift of your religion in this life is it gives you meaning. It gives you a sense of purpose. You know how many shahadas we've had here in the last like two weeks? So many. A lot. Very good. Thank you, Irma. Yeah, we've had a lot. Many of, many of them probably here, right? And some of you who are not Muslim yet, inshallah, a couple days. Come on, talk to me. Let's do this, right? We have a lot of shahadas, mashallah. There's a masjid in Philadelphia. They had in Ramadan alone 222 shahadas. Okay, why? And you ask, I want you to understand, you ask them, you know, we asked Sister Julia, she, she accepted Islam, uh, uh, I was here on, sorry, I travel too much, I was here on Thursday, Friday. Friday. Yeah. Friday, you're right, I was here Friday, okay, so I was here on Friday, and remember we asked her, I gave her the mic, I said, tell me why you accepted Islam, and she goes, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was, I was born Catholic, right, Mexican family, born Catholic, and she goes, my mom had a coworker or colleague that gave her a translation of the Quran. If you got, did, were you there? Did you hear the story? It's actually amazing. She goes, the guy gave my mom a translation of the Quran. My mom just kept it. And then she said later in my life, like my mom just gave me that book. Like, here, read this. Mom is not Muslim, by the way. Here, read this. So then she goes, I had it for a while. And then everything started happening in, in Palestine. And I started to think about the purpose of life. And I started to open up this book and read it and everything made sense. She goes, I just felt like I was Muslim. And she goes, I'm here now to accept my shahada, my Islam, and to become part of the Muslim community. And then I asked her after, I said, do you know whatever happened to that guy who gave the translation of the Quran? She goes, no. All right? She goes, no. So there's two lessons here. Number one is don't ever discount any good that you do for anybody. If you give someone a translation of the Quran, if you answer any question, not even water? Yes, sit down. Let me tell you, not even water. All right, let me talk to you about fasting. Don't, don't think it's a waste of time. It happened again, wallahi, this morning, guys. Or not, not this morning, yesterday I was flying. Remember I told you on Saturday, they, the shaitan keeps testing me when I'm, when I'm fasting. Shaitan on the flight, he's like, he comes in the form of a stewardess. And she's offering me Biscoff cookies and ginger ale, which you only drink on planes, ginger ale, right? And I'm like, no. And she's like, are you sure? And then she's like, let me give you the whole can. And I'm like, I really cannot. I want to keep my fast. It happened again. And the lady actually said that. She goes, not even water? I was like, you are a meme right now. In the Muslim world, you just became a meme, right? I should have taken a picture of her and wrote not even water underneath it. So I said to her, normally I just say no. I don't want to like, you know, I'm also kind of conscious about like my, I don't want to waste my breath and all that kind of stuff and talk and get you know, dry mouth and all that. So, but then I was telling her, because it was getting close to iftar when I was landing, I said, no, I'm fasting. I'm Muslim. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I go, you don't have to apologize for me being Muslim. There's nothing wrong with me being Muslim. Right? You don't apologize. And she's like, I'm sorry. I said, no. And I said, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there is a weakness that you feel from fasting, but there's a certain strength that you can get from that weakness. And she was like, that was really deep. And I said, I know. And I said the same thing actually when I was working out. There's a guy at my gym. He's a trainer. And he knows I'm fasting. And he goes, how do you feel? How do you feel? And I said, I actually feel stronger. I feel like when I'm lifting, when I'm running, when I, I feel stronger. There's a weird strength that you can pull from this. If you really focus, you can pull this strength from it, right? And so the point being is that we should never discount even those small moments that you have with somebody. Somebody might ask you, like, what, is, what does your name mean? For me, it's impossible. I can't get around it. My name is not like, like Ayub or like, my name is Abdurrahman, 
what does that mean? I'm like, here we go. I'm like, Ar-Rahman is the name of God, the most merciful. Abd means the one who is a servant of or who worships. And I said, so I'm the worshiper of the most merciful. Oh, that's nice. What is that? I said, it's a Muslim name, right? And then explaining that to them. Who knows? They might meet or date some guy named Abdurrahman, astaghfirullah, and then they might end up becoming Muslim at some point, and that might have been the introduction into how they even recognize that name, astaghfirullah, but then hopefully they end up accepting Islam and repenting for the dating and then, you know, having a halal relationship. The point being, don't ever discount. لا تحقرن من المعروف شيء The Prophet ﷺ said. But the second point, and this is what the sister mentioned, is you don't just lose out on the akhirah. That's bad enough. But you also lose out on your purpose in this dunya. There are so many things that we experience and that we do in this life that can only be explained as this is part of my Islam. Why am I patient? Why am I a good person? Why do I not uh, get involved in criminal things, in unethical things? Why? I only stay away from all of this. Why? Because I'm Muslim. Because I'm Muslim. I have this really, really funny conversation with uh, 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 one of the brothers. It's, you know, we don't say that we would do this if we weren't Muslim because, alhamdulillah, we don't even want to entertain that. But we're always shocked at certain elements in the world that are just protected by people's goodwill. One of them, have you guys ever thought about the baggage claim at airports, how no one ever checks your ID? Am I just creating a room full of criminals now? You know, you pull off any bag and you just walk out. And I always think to myself, subhanAllah, this is a proof of people having some level of taqwa of God. Is that at some level, in some way, everybody knows and respects the fact that we just traveled, we got off a long flight, I'm not going to take someone else's bag, I'm going to take my own, and I'm going to... Because the reality is that we respect the fact that this is an unethical thing to do. Right? Or now going into restaurants and picking up your DoorDash orders. They're not checking names. I've been to Chipotle. They're like, Kevin. I'm like, that's me. Right? I just walk out. Not, I'm just joking. But in reality, anyone could do that. All these examples are present. But people have this innate fitrah. Allah created all of us with this concern generally. Now, as you get older and as you choose your paths in life, that fitrah can either be magnified by your faith can either be strengthened by your iman or it can be beaten down and covered by the sins that we do. And so when a person doesn't have their faith protected, they ultimately lose their purpose in life. They lose their compass. They're not able to understand what's correct, what's incorrect. They're not able to make the same right decisions that they once made before. So Ibn Rajab here, he quotes some narrations. Let me share with you some stuff that's really amazing, okay? A lot of us, there's, a, there's an ethic that's kind of circulating in the world today of being spiritual. I want to be spiritual. What people typically mean by that is I want to have a relationship with God. Okay? I want to have a relationship with the creator and sustainer of the universe, with God. Religious is a connotation that typically re- alludes to or points to following a set protocol or rules. So what you'll find today on the internet and in New York City because New York City is just the internet in real life, okay? What you'll find today is people saying, I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. You guys ever heard that before, that ethic? I want to be close to God, but I don't want to have to like follow any sort of protocol, okay? Again, in, in the abstract world, it sounds like a pretty easy idea. Okay, but that's similar to a person saying, I want to be healthy, but I don't want to follow any sort of health guidelines. Or I want to save money, but I don't want to stop spending. There are certain rules and restrictions and best practices that anything asks of you to be successful in the ultimate goal that you have. If you want to be a person that's successful in academics and in your career, that requires certain, ri- certain regimen, certain reality. If a person wants to be close to Allah and have this relationship with Allah, it requires a level of devotion in their religious commitment. But this narration is amazing. It shows us that the religious commitment that you have actually translates far beyond what you can see. Okay? Let me ask you guys a question. When you read the Quran, when you sit there and you read, I saw a bunch of people, mashallah, trying to get their Quran. And whenever you read Quran or listen to Quran, what do you imagine is happening to you? Do you ever think about that? 
What do you think is happening to you as you read the Quran? Do you have, is that your Mus'haf or is that a notebook? A notebook, okay. Okay, mashallah. No shame. Notebook is good enough. Nice watermelon, mashallah, right? Anyone here? When you read the Quran, what do you think is happening to you as a person? Yeah. Good. Number one, we have a hadith which says what? That the angels are surrounding you, making dua for you. While you read Quran, or while you're in the presence of the Quran, the angels are praying for you. The angels are praying, oh Allah, forgive this person. Oh Allah, grant them Jannah. Oh Allah, forgive their family. Oh Allah, protect them. Oh Allah, this, this. So now you're reading Quran, and how many of you have been like, okay, I've read enough. But then you're thinking in your head, okay, if as soon as I close this, Angel Jibreel is about to leave. All these angels that are praying for me are about to step away. I would actually like for them to keep making dua for me. So I'm going to keep reading a little bit. That's number one. What else happens to a person when they read the Quran? Anything? Be creative, huh? Yeah, yeah, with your daughter, yeah. Sorry, I can't. In the blue, Abaya. Okay, good. When the person hears the Quran, when the person reads the Quran, do you guys feel tranquility in your heart? Do you feel like there's a sense of sakina that falls upon you? Allah Ta'ala actually says this uh, uh, in the Quran. He mentions this, that when they hear the Quran being recited, it causes their hearts to feel tranquil. It, hearts, it causes their hearts to feel tranquil. Okay, very good. Anyone else? What else do you think of? Someone else had something. Nothing else happens when we read the Quran. Okay. But when I'm, I have the book open and I just see that it's up again, my head just flies. Okay, interesting. So you read the Quran and then all of a sudden you're like, I can't be the same person now. Yeah. Okay, good. And by the way, you see this even like at weddings and stuff. When the Quran reciter comes up, the DJ is like, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> DJ turns the music off. You know, the aunties put the napkins on their head. <laughs> okay. But they d I'm not laughing. Well, I'm not, I know I'm laughing. I'm not trying, trying not to laugh. Okay. It's not funny. It's cute. But I will say this. It's very beautiful to see a respect for the word of Allah. Okay. Now, that respect should not stop with a napkin on the head or the DJ stopping. Right? Um, it should also not stop. The respect should not be just like that we close our, the mushaf and we put it on the highest point in our house and we say, that's my Quran. The respect for the Qur'an should be a real respect, a relationship of respect. Can I tell you something? There's a narration that is told to us, uh, and it's narrated, uh, Ibn Abi Dunya, he recorded it, that Hakim Ibn Aban relates from Abu Makki, that when death approaches a person, when the angel of death shows up at your doorstep, man, I saw the most incredible video the other day of a dramatization of death, and I thought it was powerful, subhanAllah. I thought it was incredible. It was a, a guy standing, and then there was a, a person, basically the same guy, but in a black hoodie, and he told him that it's time to go. And the guy realized that it was death, and he goes, can I just have one more moment? And the angel of death said, it's too late, you're gone already. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, when the angel of death comes, maybe, maybe it's not you, maybe it's just me. In my own ignorance, I'm imagining that there's going to be like a conversation where at least I can like hold him off and like say goodbye to my loved ones. But that's not how it works. When the angel of death comes, by the time the person is greeted by the angel, there is no negotiation. Now, for the good souls, may Allah make us amongst them, that angel shows up as a beautiful, beautiful angel, handsome, smelling good. And the angel comes, I want you to imagine like the fanciest hotel or restaurant you've ever seen in your life. The angel comes like one of the butlers or the, it's time, it's time to go now, right? Are you ready? It's time to go meet Allah. Allah wants to meet you. He's calling you back. So there's no uh, fear. There's no anger. There's no difficulty. But for the bad souls, may Allah Ta'ala protect us from ever being amongst them. It's a very, very difficult process. Now, when the angel of death comes to a good soul, the angel is told, smell the head of this person. Do you smell the, 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 the musk? And the angel says, hold on. And the angel takes a smell of the head of the person and says, I smell the Quran. I smell the musk of the Quran. And then the angel is told, okay, now sense the heart. Do you smell the musk coming from his heart or her heart? And the angel says, yes, I smell the action of siyam, of fasting from their heart. And then the angel is told, go to their feet, smell their feet. 
and the angel goes to the feet and smells musk and says, I smell the qiyam, the standing in taraweeh prayer on the feet of this person. And then that person is taken and the angel says, this person protected their faith in Allah. And so today on the day that I'm taking their soul, Allah has protected them. And these are all signs of their protection. May Allah make us amongst them. Do you see how these actions don't just stop when you d stop doing them? You are perfuming your soul. You're, in, you're adorning your soul. You're preparing your soul for the time that is inevitable. As Allah Ta'ala says, every single soul will taste the experience of death. A smart person doesn't try to avoid it. A smart person thinks about, how can I be ready for that moment? What can I do? And as you do these small deeds, you might think it's small. You might think it's like the smallest thing ever to listen to 10 minutes of Quran or five minutes of Quran in the morning or on your way here. You might think it's like, what's the big deal? But you don't realize that you're perfuming your, your soul, the essence of your body. You might think it's not a big deal that you're fasting today. It's a huge deal that you're fasting today. Now the angel, when they come to take your soul, they're going to smell that you're a person of fasting. And when you stand in Taraweeh prayer, whether it's two, four, eight, however long, you are preparing yourself for that moment. And that's one of the ways in which Allah Ta'ala protects your faith is that you become a person who's immediately recognizable as a person of Jannah. May Allah Ta'ala give us that. There's another uh, 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 narration that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is recorded to have said or taught Omar to say that, O oh Allah, keep me firm on my Islam while I'm standing. Keep me firm in my Islam while I'm sitting. Keep me firm in my Islam while I'm reclining and keep me protected from any envy that comes my way. This is a dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught to Omar. Now the standing, sitting, and reclining is not only a literal thing, but it's also a demonstration of any situation. When you're standing, you're out and about in the world. When you're sitting, you're relaxing and you're resting or you're spending time with people, you're socializing. And when you're reclining, you're sleeping. And this dua is being told to Omar is what? You should never take your faith for granted even for one moment. Never. Because you might be in a situation while you're out in the world or while you're socializing with friends or while you're laying down to go to sleep where you feel your faith might be slipping away because it wasn't being preserved and protected. And so there needs to be a constant dua, supplication to Allah, Oh Allah, protect my faith in every circumstance. You know, I always talk about this and maybe some of you can relate to this, but especially, especially when a person leaves, this is actually why Roots was even made, by the way. Roots was made to, to deal with and to help provide community for the community of people after they leave their home and they have to engage with faith on their own for the first time. Because when a person, when you don't have your mom and dad saying like, did you pray namaz paro? Did you pray salah? Salih habibi? You don't, when you don't have that and you're by yourself in your apartment or your dorm on campus or you live in a new city and you're working, you're like, do, do I have to? And it's really at that moment, you might have been born or raised Muslim or you might have been Muslim for a long time now, but it's really at that moment that you have to decide, like, I want to be Muslim actually. It's no longer just like a, a thing that I'm doing because my parents told me to. Now on my own, by myself, I get to see how real of a Muslim I am. If I get up and pray when no one reminds me, I'm by myself, I'm on campus, I'm in Austin, right? I always have these parents, man, Masakin, their kids go to Austin for school and they're like, please make dua for them. I'm like, I am. They're like, no, really, please, it's Austin. You know, I, was it called? Fifth Street, Sixth Street? I don't know. Just go to the masjid. Uh, even, subhanAllah, you know, parents who send their kids off to school, it's really scary. It's really scary. You know, my son is seven. I only have 10 years left until he starts applying uh, uh, to colleges and I make him go to community college to stay close to home. <laughs> no, really, it's scary because you wonder to yourself, like, what have I done to prepare this person to be able to believe in Allah and carry on this lineage? And so the Prophet Sallallahu he taught us, make dua that Allah protect your faith. Don't assume for a second that it's just going to be there automatically, okay? The one thing that you can do really to safeguard and to test how strong is my faith, and we'll finish here with this, is the quality of your prayer, the, regular, the, the regularity of it, the consistency of it, and the quality of it. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he says, narrated by Tabrani, he says that when the servant of Allah offers prayer and prays as it should be prayed, meaning what? Like in a good way. 
So you pray in a good way. It doesn't mean that you pray forever, by the way. Whenever I say you offer prayer in a good way, I'm not saying like Asr takes 45 minutes. I'm not saying that, all right? What I'm saying is you're fully focused. You're there, okay? When you offer prayer, your prayer in that moment ascends up to the heavens. As soon as you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, in that moment, I want you guys to imagine this at Maghrib, your prayer ascends to the heavens. And it meets with the angels. And the angels, they inspect that prayer. You're like turning into your exam. They inspect that prayer. And if your prayer was good, if you focused on it, if it wasn't like a, do I have wudu, what rakah is this? If it wasn't one of those. If it was actually a nice prayer, few minutes, alone time, quality time with Allah, then the angel says that this prayer is good and the prayer speaks and says, may Allah protect this person just like they took care of me. And the prayer comes back down uh, uh, and, is, and is accepted by Allah basically. Now when the person treats a prayer poorly and rushes through and doesn't, and doesn't care, doesn't think, doesn't know anything about what they're doing in the prayer, the same uh, submission process is made. It's elevated up to the heavens, it's presented to Allah, and then subhanAllah, it looks like a shabby piece of cloth. And the angel looks at this and says, what is this? Really? Have you guys ever taught like a Sunday school class before? Or like anyone here? You know, like the person turns in the, cr the crumpled up worksheet and you look at it and you're like, what is this? You know? And subhanAllah, you always think to yourself like, what does it matter? It's the same work. All the answers are on it. But isn't there a difference in how you turn things in? You prepare your resume, right? Are you going to send in like a really like wonky, ugly resume? No, you're going to actually, there's services. You send it, you pay them. You say, clean this up for me, please. Because your first impression is your last impression. So this salah is like your first impression with the angels. You send it up. It looks like a shabby cloth. And the angel takes the cloth, rolls it back up, and throws it down. And in the spiritual realm, the hadith says, it strikes the heart of the person. And it strikes them right in the face. And basically the angel says, just like you rejected your prayer in this life, this prayer was rejected for you. So the one indication, if you want to know, if you're like me, you read these narrations and you're like, oh God. If you're like me and you're like, how do I know? The one indication that we can walk out of roots tonight with is, how is my salah? Bas, that's it. How is my salah? Everything else, I'm telling you, everything else will come. There's a hadith where the companions came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we caught him. The Prophet ﷺ was like, what? He said, there's a guy who is a, he's a thief, he steals. We got him, let's, right, let's take care of business on this guy. The Prophet ﷺ was like, let's do it. No, he didn't say that, okay? He asked one question, a single question. It's going to blow your mind. He said, does he pray? This is, a, this is a person who was caught stealing, right? We might even call him in some world like a thief. The Prophet ﷺ said, does he pray? The companions were almost like, uh, yeah, but he's a thief. The Prophet ﷺ said, leave him be. Leave him be. And then he gave the principle. The principle is what? He said, one of the two will leave. Either the stealing or the prayer. So give him some time. See how he develops. So if you and I are trying really to work on ourselves this Ramadan, and we want to see, can I get rid of these bad habits, these things I'm struggling with, try to pray and see what regular prayer does. Allah says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْعَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ munkar." That as salah it prohibits and it stops you from doing things that are otherwise so detestable and so ugly it stops you completely you want to stop using bad language start to pray you want to stop dressing a certain way start to pray you want to stop socializing in a certain way start to pray and see the prayer it's like uh, um it's like the guilty eyes of a child today i was leaving for <laughs> i was leaving for work and musa looks at me he goes you're leaving and i go yeah and he goes you always leave and i was like yeah that's how work works dude <laughs> right and I go, okay, come with me. I brought him with me. But the only reason I brought him with me was because he gave me those guilty eyes, right? And he has like this, this smile now because his teeth are going in. So it's like, you know, he's got like, almost looks like a baby again. 
because you always leave. You just got back this morning. Why are you leaving? It gets to the point now where when I come downstairs or when I leave out of my room in a thobe, my kids are like, no, he's going to work. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. I'm just wearing a thobe. I have to go get milk. I'll be back, right? Uh, but the point being is the salah puts you in that mode of feeling that guilt. And that's okay. It's, it's okay. Don't run away from the guilt. Allow the salah to change your life. My, my, one of my teachers used to tell us, if you ever get tempted to do something haram, just pray two rakah and then do it. If you want to do something haram, like really bad, it's fine. He said, just pray two rakah, then do it. We're like, Sheikh, that is the definition of a uh, bad vibe, a buzzkill. <laughs> Literally, you're like, you want to do something haram? Yeah, just pray two rakah. We're like, we're definitely not going to do that thing after praying two rakah. He goes, that's the point. That's the point, right? May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Okay, now, the next section is he says that in the hadith itself, he says, He says, O oh, Ibn Abbas, there's another beautiful thing that will happen for you. If you preserve your relationship with Allah, you will always find him with you. You will always find him in front of you. And this is kind of a summary of the last two sections, but there's a new wrinkle to it. And that is that he tells him a very important principle of life. We kind of alluded to this. When you are on your own, there is a, you become prime, you become a prime target for shaitan. And you become very vulnerable and weak to your own nafs. And this is why being in the jama'ah, being in a congregation is so important. Having good friends is so critical. Being around people that remind you just by their presence, not even verbally, but just by their presence, they remind you to do the right thing is one of the blessings of being part of the Muslim community. Being around people. You guys know what I'm talking about? How, how does Ramadan feel when you're by yourself versus when you're around people? Totally different. When you're surrounded by community and you see people that are doing the right things, you feel motivated to do those same things. And so he tells Ibn Abbas here, if you remember Allah at every time, you will find him to be present with you at every time, every single time. What this does to you is a few things. Number one, Allah in the Quran says, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ That he is with you wherever you are. This can do a few things. Number one, it helps to guide your decisions. If you realize that Allah is present with you, then you remember Allah in every scenario. There's a, a narration, actually, the Prophet ﷺ was speaking to Mu'adh bin Jabal. And Mu'adh was just given the responsibility to go to Yemen. Shout out to all the coffee shops, right? He was given the responsibility to go to Yemen and to teach this new community of Muslims how to be Muslim. He was basically the Imam of Yemen, Mu'adh bin Jabal. And as he's departing, the Prophet ﷺ, he tells him, this three-part advice. And by the way, this applies for any and all of us, by the way. These three advices. Number one is he says, Remember Allah, ittaqillah, haythuma kunta. Remember Allah wherever you are. Wherever you are, remember Allah. If you're in any scenario, your understanding of how good you are in that environment should be directly related to how quickly and how comfortably you can remember Allah. If it's awkward to remember Allah, if it feels weird or bad, then you might not be in the right environment. You might be at the wrong place. When I used to hang out with my friends growing up in Chicago, we'd go out. And Chicago, beautiful city, fourth holiest city in the world, doesn't mean that it doesn't have, it can have some unholy parts. May Allah protect us, right? So we'd go out with some friends, and alhamdulillah, we were all good guys. But my mom thought, anyone here, you're like, you're a good person, but your parents think you're the worst? Okay, so my mom thought I was like always going to do like bad things or whatever. So she would always tell me, it wasn't every, it wasn't every, every night, but it was like once a month. So I'd be leaving the house. Okay, salam, mama, I'll see you, inshallah. Like, salam, habibi. Hey, just remember one thing. And I thought she was going to say like, remember to pick up something, remember to lock the door, remember this and that, feed the cats, all this. She goes, remember one thing. Don't go where there's no angels. Okay, salam alaikum. I was like, what? Don't go where there's no angels. 
I go, what do you mean? She goes, angels hate places where Allah is being disobeyed. Don't go there. And then one time I asked her, I said, you, you know, you say this to me. It's kind of like a really scary thing to say. And it's like giving me like weird vibes. And she goes, well, I just don't want you to die in a place where there's no angels to pray for you when you die. That's what she said. My mom is tough, by the way. T-U-F-F tough. Like she's not. I'm going to say right now, looking at the room, like half of y'all couldn't cut it. You would melt. She said, I don't want you to die in a place where there's no angels to pray for you as your soul is being taken. So if you put yourself in an environment at a club or at a concert or da-da-da-da-da and you shouldn't be there, she goes, and something happens and you pass away, she goes, how do you think I'm going to feel knowing that you passed away in that environment? That was her mindset, right? Guard that relationship with Allah and you will always find yourself in a situation where he is present with you in the best possible way. So he said, Remember Allah wherever you are. It's always going to make you have the right decision. And then he said, after that, Follow every bad deed that you make. This is actually very interesting because the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him don't make mistakes. He said, follow every mistake you make. It's okay. Just follow it with a good deed. Immediately. And then he said, Treat people well. Treat people with good character. You know what I think is so profound about this hadith? Number one is that it's super short. It's very short. Like three advices. Remember Allah wherever you are. If you make a mistake, do something good right after it. And be good to people. Bas. But you know what's amazing? The first advice leads to the second two advices. If you remember Allah wherever you are, when you make a mistake, it's not a sign that you didn't remember Allah. A sign that you didn't remember Allah is that you made the mistake and you didn't make istighfar. You didn't try to fix it. That's a sign that you're not remembering Allah. Because all human beings make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Even as we're remembering that Allah is there, we make a mistake. But a sign that you are just consciously neglecting Allah in your life is what? You make the mistake and then you're like, whatever. Who cares? It is what it is. This is who I am. That's the absence of remembering Allah. And then as a result of that, a person who doesn't have a good relationship with Allah, they're not going to have a good relationship with people either. Because they're not going to respect the rights of people. They're not going to treat people well. Isn't it true that half of the reason why you treat people well is because you know Allah is watching? Isn't that the case? Aren't there moments where you could do something, you could say something, and you hold your tongue? Why? Why do you hold your tongue? Because you know that Allah is rewarding you for that patience in that moment, right? Literally, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I promise a palace in the middle of Jannah for the one who, even though they're right in arguing, they don't argue. They give up. They say, no, I'm not going to argue. So much of how we treat people is connected to our relationship with Allah. The stronger your relationship with Allah is, the better your character should be. It should be demonstrated in that, in that moment. So many of the converts, you know, we talked about 220 converts in, in, in what, two weeks? In two weeks in Philadelphia. So many of the people that accepted Islam accepted because they had a good interaction with someone who was Muslim. That's the story of my dad. You know, my dad's a convert. I know I say that and half of you are still confused. I'm not the convert. My dad is. Poor guy doesn't get any credit. My dad converted to Islam because of what? He said, a young Somali boy. He said, a young Somali boy sat down with me. Shout out Somalia. He said, young Somali. Shout out bananas and rice. He said, a young Somali boy sat with me. What yeah, right? In a coffee shop in Egypt and explained to me what Fajr was. My dad didn't know what Fajr was. And he asked, why is everyone waking up and going to the area, to this, you know, they didn't know what it was Musalla. Why are they going to this area? And the young boy, instead of being like, ah, kafir. <laughs> what does this guy want, you know? He's the only one who spoke any English. And he sat with my dad and he worked at the coffee shop, probably underage, it's Egypt. And he sat with him and he said, we pray five times a day. We're Muslim, we believe in Allah. And this is the first prayer of the day. And this, 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 and you can watch it if you want. And he was so nice to him. And then my dad, subhanAllah, he accepted Islam shortly after. And then he worked and lived in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And he helped build King Fahad, uh, Mustashfa King Fahad, the hospital there. And my dad said that the character of the people that I met 
Indonesia, Saudi, you know, Bang Bangladesh, Pakistan, all over Egypt. The character is what made me love Islam. And then this is the sad part. Can I tell you the sad part? He said, when I came back to America and I attended the masjid, and it's actually a very Ramadan-centric story. He says, in Ramadan, in Riyadh, we would all eat together. There was a culture of like everyone eating together, right? He said, when I came back to America, I went to the masjid, and I saw that there was a section of people having iftar for the, in one area, and there was a section people having iftar in another area. Basically, two separate iftars in the same building. Okay, two separate groups, like, no, we're not. And then my dad, he was, you know, he's relatively new to Islam, and he suggested, he goes, why don't we just come together? He goes, you know, back in, in Riyadh, we used to just eat together. And the first group, I'm not going to say their ethnicity, but I'm going to let you figure it out. The first group said, ugh, their food is too spicy. So then my dad went to the other group and said, hey, why don't we join them? And they said, ugh, their food is too bland. And then those... Are we, do, are we on the same page about ethnicities? Okay, so, and then he said, that initial distaste because of spice and blandness and yada yada became like a personal attack now. And I don't like them, they're this. And they're stingy. And they're this. And they're that. Right? And my dad said, subhanAllah, the first time that I ever saw this like divisiveness in character amongst Muslims, he said, unfortunately, was at a masjid in America. You see how important it is for us to have good character? It's so important. It's quite possibly the case that you might be the first or only Muslim anybody ever meets. It's possible. It's not like crazy to think that, right? Or that they know that they're meeting, right? They might meet other Muslims, especially if they have to go to the doctor. Uh, they might meet other Muslims, but they might not realize at the moment that that person's a Muslim. And so we do have a distinct responsibility, absolutely, to have taqwa of Allah and to live as if we're seeing Allah in every scenario because that's what's going to make you make the right choice. What's, what's going to protect your tongue from saying something you regret is that you know Allah is watching and doing the right thing, okay? So he says, Follow up every bad deed with a good deed because what? It will erase it and treat people well. And then I'll finish with this last uh, uh, bit that is mentioned here, this last narration. Um, another effect of remembering Allah and having Him in front of you is not only that it corrects your behavior and it gives you good character with people, but it also gives you, it's like stress relief. It's anxiety relief. The Prophet ﷺ was making hijrah with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and they were leaving from Mecca to Medina and they were being chased. They were being chased down by people who were hired to capture them and to either kill them or bring them back. So in this journey, they took refuge in this place known as Ghar al-Thawr, the cave of al-Thawr. And they were hiding there. Now this cave is actually very shallow, incredibly shallow. It's, it's, it's super, it's, it's barely a cave. And if one person sits in this cave, it's small enough, let alone two people. So the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr were in this cave and they were hiding and the people that were tracing their steps were coming closer and closer and closer. Now on this cave there were a few artifacts. Allah sent a spider to come and build a web and that there was a nest of a bird and all these things. Nevertheless, these people were coming to inspect every single you know, orifice that they could find to see if the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr were there. Abu Bakr looks down this, there's a lot of things that happen here, but as of one of the things, he looks down at his feet and he looks at the Prophet Wasallam, and their feet are like sticking out of the cave. Does that make sense? It's like a really shallow closet. You know, you can't really hide in it. So they're sticking out of the cave. He tells the Prophet Wasallam, Abu Bakr whispers to him, he says, Ya Rasulullah, if they look at their feet, even if they just look down, forget looking in the cave, if they just look down for a moment, he says, they're going to find us. And you can feel in this statement the beating of the heart of Abu Bakr pounding out of his chest. You can feel it, the fear, the anxiety, right? What does the Prophet ﷺ say? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't point to the spider's web and say, oh, they're not going to look here or the nest. None of that. He says, 
ما ظنك يا أبا بكر He says let me ask you a question What would you think What would you say If I told you بإثنين ثالثهما الله What if I told you that there were two people But their third was Allah And the Quran says In this moment إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا Don't be afraid. Don't grieve. Allah is with us. And then he says, subhanAllah, Allah says, فَأَنزَلَ Allah Ta'ala sent down upon them عَلَيْهِ السَّكِينَ The tranquility that came down upon them. One of the virtues and the values of having Allah with you at all times is this. You're going to be in a tough spot in life. People are going to come at you They're going to say things about you. They're going to challenge you. Life is not easy. Yes or no? True or false? Is life hard? Yes, life is hard. This does not take away the difficulty. Believing in Allah, being close to Allah does not take away your difficulty. But it does what? It makes you strong enough to handle it. Abu Bakr, it didn't change the people, by the way. The people were still looking. The bounty hunters were still looking for them. Allah did not just divert them away. Allah did not like strike them with a lightning bolt and they just exploded. Oh, Allah saved us. No, they still carried out their mission. But what happened? When they got to that cave, they saw the spider web, they saw the nest, and they said, there's no way somebody could be in here. Why? Because these things are still here. If they were hiding here, it would all be disrupted. You see how Allah Ta'ala can protect you even with something as weak as the web of a spider? That if wind blows, it can knock it down? An empty bird's nest? Allah can protect you with anything. What's important is not how He's going to protect you, but it's that you're always with Him to be able to receive that protection. If I neglect Allah, what I'm really doing is I'm neglecting the protection that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala can give me. I'm protecting, I'm taking on my own responsibility to protect myself, and I'm saying that, you know what? I'm good. When in reality, none of us can protect ourselves. We need the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah ta'ala to give us tawfiq, inshallah. We ask Allah to accept from us all of our time that we spend reflecting on his book. We ask Allah ta'ala to make us those people that always remember him in any scenario that we're in. That we are conscious of him in every scenario, in every moment. We ask you, O oh Allah, to give us the ability to rectify all of our mistakes with a good deed. And that you erase the, the effect of the bad deed that we did. And we ask you, O Allah, to make that taqwa, that God consciousness that we have, the result of which is that we have good character with people and that we become a good role model and a representative of the religion of Islam and of the example of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa O Allah, we ask you to protect us in every time, in every scenario, in those that are good and bad. We ask you, O Allah, to protect us from arrogance. We ask you to protect us from conceitedness in times that are good. And we ask you to protect us from times that are bad, Ya Allah, the danger and the anxiety and the fear and the grief that we experience, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. O Allah, we ask you to accept from us all of our fasting and all of our recitation of the Qur'an and all of our listening to the Qur'an and our prayer and our charity and accept all of our good deeds, any intention that we have, any time that we spend for your sake, Ya Allah, accept it in our Ramadan. O Allah, accept this Ramadan from us and give us the ability to witness the night of power, Ya Allah. Give us the ability to find you on the night of power, Ya Allah, with a dua that we make that is sincere from our hearts, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. O Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to allow us to be able to have our night of power accepted. That all of the worship that we feel on that night is accepted and given to us in the form of over a thousand months, as you said in the Quran, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. O Allah, we ask you, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, to accept all of our duas that we make for ourselves, for our family, for our friends, for our community, and for those brothers and sisters across the world that we love so dearly, Ya Allah. From the bottom of our hearts as we beg and pray and yearn for their safety and for their determination and for their agency and for their prosperity, Ya Allah. Our brothers and sisters in Palestine, our brothers and sisters in Sudan, our brothers and sisters in Burma, our brothers and sisters in the, in, that are suffering at the hands of the Chinese, our Uyghur brothers and sisters, Ya Allah, and every other group, Ya Allah, that is suffering and that is being oppressed, O Allah, we seek only your help and your aid, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Muhammad. I want to ask everyone to continue, inshallah. We have one minute left. One minute to make dua for yourself in this last minute of fasting. The Prophet Sallallahu said the last duas that you make in the last moments of the day of fasting are accepted by Allah. So continue for one minute to make dua for yourself and your family and your loved ones, inshallah, and the ummah.
Amin, amin, ya Rabbil Amin. Barakallah feekum, jazakallah khairan, everybody. We have our dates and water that are situated around the room. Please help yourself and also maybe, you know, take some initiative to help others in, in getting those dates, uh, bi'idhnillah. And then if anyone can help us, inshallah, by moving the backjacks up to the front and helping us fold chairs, we would really, really appreciate it. May Allah accept from all of us. Amin, ya Rabbil. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After Maghrib, iftar will be served in the multi-purpose hall. Feel free to eat in there, of course. Uh, we also want to ask everyone, just please help clean up after yourself. That would be amazing, inshallah. It would make it a lot easier for us as a staff to be able to worship, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.